soon. Thank you. Uh, the introduction uh, raises an interesting question that I'm going to not answer yet. Assuming I can get this to work. Here we go. There we go. So what do these have to do with art? You have a CT image, a positron emission tomography image, and a magnetic resonance imaging image of somebody's brain. And what could possibly relate these to art? Well, as difficult as that question might be, here's another connection. Um, a person who's getting ready for neurosurgery used to have to wear one of these devices, this frame, and it was in, the person was imaged with this frame on, and so that provided reference points in the images, whether they were CT or MR or whatever, that then could be used by the neurosurgeon because the surgeon could reference to physical points on this device, which didn't get removed from the head until the surgery was finished. So this was screwed into the, into the uh, skull prior to imaging, stayed on during the surgery, and then was removed. The key in both of those, in, in, in those cases is to find reference points. And so another way would be to implant these sorts of devices on a skull and image with them, and it turns out these work very well as, uh, also and much less intrusive than the frame. But in all those cases, what we're trying to do is find reference points, points that are present on the skull in 3D that also are present in the images. And the idea then is that one can then align these images, can overlay them accurately by identifying reference points on the, on the two objects and mat matching them up, applying some sort of transform to get this to overlay onto that very accurately. Well, that's wonderful and it's great for medicine, but still, what does it have to do with art? Well, let's look at this famous painting by Picasso, which you can go today to the National Gallery of Art and look at. It's hanging on the wall, called Le Gourmet, and, and what you will see looking at it is this. And that's a very nice and interesting painting. What happens, however, if you look at it in different ways? In particular, one could x-ray it which would yield an image that looks like that, which doesn't look particularly interesting, but we're going to see something, you might see hints of something in there. One could look at it in infrared, and infrared, as you know, begins just above the red in wavelength, the visible red, and goes on a long way. And in this band, 1,000 to 1,100 nanometers, this is what you'll see. But let's look at a different band, 1450 to 1670. Here is a completely different painting that Picasso painted on this canvas before he painted Le Gourmet. Well, if you're an art historian or perhaps an art conservator, this is of enormous interest. You certainly don't want to have to scrape off Le Gourmet to see this work that he had done earlier. And so looking at the image, at the painting, with different wavelengths of light reveals a number of interesting characteristics. Well, that's great too, but what does that have to do with registration? Well, the answer is that sometimes when you image a painting in these different modalities, x-ray, visible, etc., you have to use obviously different cameras. And they're going to be taken with different configurations of tripods or other scanning devices. And those images acquired by the different cameras are not going to line up accurately. Well, okay, but who cares? Why do I need to overlay the x-ray onto the visible, et cetera? Well, I'm going to show you some examples of where it turns out a lot can be learned if one can line these up accurately. Let's take a different painting in the gallery's collection, Christ Among the Doctors. On the left, you see it in color, as you would see it in the gallery. And on the right, an infrared version of uh, infrared image acquired of the same work of art. And let's look now at some details of this. In particular, we see the hand and the other hand, the right hand, and the book. Pay attention to those for a moment. This is the color image magnified. And here it is in infrared in that band of, uh, of wavelength, 1500 to 1800. And if I flip back and forth, you may be able to see slight movement in the left hand, oops, some movement in the, uh, some differences in the right hand, and also in the left sleeve. 
this will become more evident in a moment, and some changes in that corner of the book. Let's now x-ray this image. Here's what we get. And again, uh, what we're seeing are changes in that, uh, in that left sleeve, right in here, that one can see when, if you flip back and forth to the color and the infrared and now to the x-ray. So that's interesting all by itself. We could not have detected those changes, those small changes, if we, had, if we were not able to overlay the color onto the x-ray accurately on the order of, say, a millimeter of error. Well, let's go a bit further. The x-ray contains some other things that were not visible in either of those previous images. These two flower-like objects are probably on the back side of this painting. This is painted on a panel. And so somewhere on the back of this are objects that were completely unknown until one examined this in the x-ray. Neither the visible nor the infrared portrayed that. There's another interesting thing here. There's a little bit of damage on the back side of the image. That, again, obviously would not have been known when one looks at it from the front. So suppose you're an art conservator who's charged with restoring this painting. Suppose there's varnish that may have to be repaired or some other problem. If you can know that there is this region of damage before you begin your process, then you know, especially if you know exactly where this is, relative to the visible painting that you can see, then you now have the opportunity and the ability to work very carefully right up to the edge of that, if necessary, from the surface, knowing that you're not going to penetrate that region of missing material. So to know accurately where that is relative to what you can see on the surface can be very useful. Now let's look at, oh, here's one more way that we can view our data. Suppose from the visible image we take the blue parts and map them as blue, and we take the green and map them as green in a new image, but now take the infrared and map that as red and construct a sort of synthetic image, which is what this is, and now what you're seeing is that the red represents the infrared, the blue the blue, and the green the green, and this gives us now an opportunity, again, if you're a conservator, to be able to combine the information from the infrared with the visible in a way that can be uh, very uh, constructive when it comes to understanding what the artist has done and also perha perhaps for conservation purposes of restoration. Let's zoom in on one part of the hand, and this is at 200%. And we're going to take now this upper part right at the shoulder. And what I want to show you is if we look at it in infrared and a zoomed version of the x-ray, what we're seeing is, because this painting is uh, 500 years old, a number of cracks have developed. And the cracks illustrate to us the, the accuracy of our registration. If you look at one of the cracks and see, oops, and see it in both modalities, you can see that there's very high... Uh, accuracy in the, uh, in the alignment of the crack as seen in infrared and the crack as seen in visible. So this was a way that we could check that the work was done correctly. Well, let's go a little bit further. Suppose we were to acquire an image in the infrared over a number of bands of infrared. In this case, going actually st starting in the visible, at 400 nanometers, which is in the visible, and going to 950. We could go farther out, and I'll show that to you in a moment. So here is a mixture of visible and infrared. We have 12 bands. Each of those bands now can yield an image. So we can have an image taken at uh, 400 nanometers, one at 450, one at 500, and so on. And we can think of that stack of slices as constituting a cube, which is what we're illustrating here, the image cube. And so wavelength is increasing into the, uh, into the screen. Why is this valuable? Well, it turns out that if we were to look at some position on this painting, a pixel, a picture element, say here, and say, OK, I'm going to virtually bore a hole through this picture at a given point, And I'm going to take the information in each of those 12 bands and use that to create a graph. 
So what I'm now plotting is the intensity at a given location, at a given pixel, at each of those 12 wavelengths. And if I do that, I get a curve that looks like this, the red curve. Well, this is fine, except that what we really want to do is akin to spectroscopy. And you will, you know, that in spectroscopy, one acquires light from some material, and the, the distribution of the energy of that light across wavelength tells us a lot about the material that it's made of, sometimes even down to the individual elements that it's composed of. So if you're interested in a painting and what a painting is composed of, having information like this could be very useful. Well, it turns out that all the standard materials have been characterized very nicely. We know what their spectra look like. Unfortunately, none of the spectra looks like the red curve. Why not? Because those 12 bands that we examined are not registered. If we register them accurately, why are they not registered is a good question. We take them all with the same camera, right? But the fact is that the different wavelengths focus themselves differently on our image plane because of chromatic aberration. The name isn't important. But the different wavelengths record themselves slightly differently. That slight difference is enough to create this red curve. If we were to register those points accurately and get this, the plot looks like this which now corresponds to what we know from ground truth about various materials. So the registration allows us to infer accurately the chemical composition of this point on the painting. And so this is a very useful uh, uh, characteristic for reasons that I'm going to talk about now. Here's a 600-year-old illuminated manuscript's initial letter. A group of monks in, uh, in uh, Italy were working, were created a whole series of these, and Lorenzo Monaco was the chief artist. And it was discovered recently by a uh, scientist at the National Gallery that the, uh, that the praying prophet turns out to have been coated with, that the paints that, that were used to paint this praying prophet were bound together with egg yolk. And uh, you'll have to take my word for a moment, but the spectra from this, in the same way as before, were characteristic of egg yolk. Well, that was very interesting to the curators and the art historians because egg white was what typically was used as a binder for paints. And they couldn't believe that this was, that this was correct. It turns out that the sheet on which this uh, illumination uh, uh, exists is one of, of two sheets that the National Gallery have that were removed at, at some point in the past from a big book that is still in Italy. So the question was, well, maybe somebody did some sort of conservation on this sheet between the time it left the book and the time it arrived, it arrived at the gallery where they, over, where they overwashed this, perhaps, with egg yolk. So the question was, was the original book this way or not? Well, we went in April to Florence, to the Museo di San Marco, and we looked at some books that, in, that have work by the same artist. And they were kind enough to uh, let us uh, il uh, examine the books. Uh, we made sure that the light was not too great to uh, potentially injure the uh, pages. Here's an example. This is a 600-year-old page from one of these books. It's in spectacular condition, as you can see. Here's another one. The quality is just uh, overwhelming, I think, uh, first of all by itself, but the fact that it has survived so well over all these years. Well, what, what resulted was that we found that, indeed, pages from the original book had the egg yolk. Now, if you're an art historian, this is a big deal because it's saying that Lorenzo Monaco, unlike his contemporaries, used egg yolk, but only for the figures of people. And it turns out that this has had great implications in the art world that I'm not fully acquainted with, but it's important, it's important stuff. <laughs> what, what also was interesting is that that book has some unfinished pages. So here's a page that the monks had begun and you can see that someone has drawn what is to be 
and has put little symbols in so that it becomes a paint-by-number project. So this workshop where the monks were producing this probably had one person who did gold and another who did uh, blue, et cetera, et cetera, and this book was going to get passed from person to person, filling in the details. So that was interesting all by itself as well. So the question is, what do these have to do with art? Well, we learned from medical imaging, we have learned from medical imaging, how to do very precise registration. Because if you're doing neurosurgery, a millimeter is important. And so we would like to be sure that the accuracy that we can obtain in medical imaging, it would be nice if we could make that same accuracy, uh, apply that same, those same techniques in art. And we've shown that we can. Uh, it may be, by the way, very soon that some of, the, some of the lessons that we're learning from our multi- and hyperspectral methods where we examine many bands will soon have application in medical imaging. This is something that's being developed, and we think our registration techniques will work in, in the medical area now that we've developed for these multispectral techniques. So paintings, humans, what's the difference? We want to know what's inside, and we want to know how to repair. And so some of the techniques that we're developing we think will be, uh, that are useful for one may be useful for the other. Well, this has, has culminated in a grant that we got recently from the National Science Foundation, jointly with the National Gallery of Art, to build a camera. This will be a camera that's portable. It can be taken from one gallery to another. It will work in low light so that we don't have to, uh, to uh, make uh, art uh, conservators and gallery uh, leaders unhappy with lots of light. It will have high spatial and spectral resolution, so we'll be able to get these multispectral images all of which can lead to understanding these binders that hold together the pigments, which will then aid conservators in, in preserving part of our, of our global cultural heritage, because a lot of these old paintings really do need restoration, and the more that they can know before they begin, the better. So these are some of my uh, collaborators and colleagues. We especially are thankful, grateful to the National Science Foundation and uh, I'll be happy to take questions um, uh, as needed. Thank you.